Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In the second part of the Ethics of Authenticity, Simone de Beauvoir is examining types or persons who make an inauthentic use of their human freedom. And the fourth type that she considers, she calls the adventurer. And the adventurer comes right after the nihilist because they have some things in common. Uh, it's actually good to read this little, little paragraph. She is, as she makes the transition, she says, it's possible that even in this failure of finding some universal absolute end, a man may nevertheless keep his taste for an existence which he originally felt as a joy, hoping for no justification. He will nevertheless take delight in living. He will seek a pretext for a gratuitous display of activity. Such a person is what we call an adventurer. And she says, he throws himself into his undertakings with zest. And so what we have here is an affectivity that is very different than the, the other ones. The nihilist was saying, oh, we don't have any pre-established values. I can't really trust anything. Nothing matters. There's kind of doom and gloom. With this, it's more, yes, nothing really matters. I can do whatever I want. I can throw myself into anything that I like. And so there's, there's something attractive to this. And she actually at another point says that um, it's close to a genuinely moral attitude. So there's a somewhat more positive valorization of it, but it, there's still some central problems. So she says that this person finds joy in spreading a freedom that is indifferent to its content. She also says th the adventurer throws themselves into action unattached to the end that is aimed at. That doesn't mean that they don't have any ends or purposes or goals, but if they miss them, ah, not a problem. We'll find another goal. The main thing is to keep on striving, to keep on doing, to keep on engaging, to move from conquest to conquest or from retreat to retreat, if that's what has to happen. Like she says, he likes action for, his, for its own sake. Whether this is based on nihilistic despair or born directly from experience of the happy days of childhood, it always implies freedom is realized as an independence in regard to the serious world, the world of the serious person, and the ambiguity of existence is felt not as a lack, but in its positive aspect. So she says, this dialectically envelops nihilism's opposition to the serious and the opposition to nihilism by existence as such. So in a way, this person is an ally of existence. They embrace existence, but they, they don't embrace existence in its totality. There's something that's going to be missing as we see. So how is this close to a genuinely moral attitude or how is this close to ethics as she says? Well, she says the, the adventurer does not propose to be, he deliberately makes himself a lack of being. From an existentialist perspective, that's a good thing. They open themselves up to possibilities, right? They don't insist that I'm only this thing. So he says that engaged in undertaking, he is at the same time detached from the goal whether he succeeds or fails, he goes right ahead, throwing himself into a new enterprise. It's not from things he expects the justification of his choices. Considering such behavior at the moment of its subjectivity, she says, we see it conforms to the requirement of ethics. This sounds pretty good so far. And then she drops the, the hammer. She says, uh, here we go. If existentialism were solipsistic, now solipsistic means thinking that you're the only 
person who matters in the world. You are the center of existence. If existentialism really was that way, then the adventurer would be the sort of, uh, you know, embodiment of existentialism. She's saying that's not the case. Others, the world of others actually matters. And so, you know, the adventurer is not the hero here. And she tells us a few things. The first is that the adventurer's attitude is not always as pure and, you know, carefree as it's pretended to be. She says, behind the appearance, there are many men who pursue a secret goal in utter seriousness. They proclaim their skepticism in regard to accepted values um, or recognized values, uh, but they are opportunistic. They are really after something. And what are the examples that she gives? She says that there's a, an attachment to some value of the serious. By that, she means they are, in fact, taking something seriously. And so we've got a lot of examples here. Fortune, right? Glory, uh, reputation, celebrity, success, doing well, careerism, uh, pleasure. She's got this great example about Don Juan. If you don't know who Don Juan was, he was a constant womanizer and he left behind a whole bunch of conquests in his wake. And she says, you know, Don Juan himself, um, you know, the taste for conquest is often subtly tied up with the taste for possession. Was seduction all that Don Juan liked? Did he not also like women? Or was he not even looking for a capable, a woman capable of satisfying him? It's possible to have multiple goals and to conceal from oneself that the adventures that one is engaging in, seemingly in a free way, are really motivated by these, these other things. There's a, a deeper problem. That would be a kind of self-deception, right? Here, the deeper problem is of not acknowledging one's relation to others in a world. The adventurer engages in undertakings, as she says, that unfold in a human world that affect other people. So there's two different options possible when one runs into that. She says, we can become conscious of the real requirements of our own freedom which will itself, uh, which can will itself only by destining itself to an open future, by seeking to extend itself by means of the freedom of others. This is a central idea to Du Beauvoir's concept of existentialism uh, and of, of the genuinely ethical. We have to recognize that our freedom is connected with the freedom of others. So if we're using our freedom in such a way as to make others less free, making ourselves the center of existence the way the adventurer often does, we're not really uh, fully realizing our own freedom. And she says, uh, we have to realize the freedom of other people must be respected. They must be helped to free themselves. Such a law imposes limits on action and at the same time gives it a content. So beyond the rejected seriousness, the seriousness of the serious person is found a genuine seriousness. And if you engage that, you really can't be the adventurer anymore. Now there's, there's you know, consequences. Now there's conditions. Now there's commitments. Now there's sacrifices that have to be made on one's own part. The other attitude is that of the adventurer who says, I understand others exist but they really exist for, you know, essentially like props for me. You could think of the adventurer as somebody who views the world that they're in as something like a, uh, you know, a game in which everybody else are ultimately non-player characters, or if they are other players, they exist to be dominated, they exist to be manipulated, they exist to be used, they exist to be collaborated with so long as it, it suits the adventurer. And um, they treat others as mere means or as obstacles or they sacrifice them. And so she gives some examples here. The fate of Italy mattered very little to the Italian condottieri. That was uh, these mercenaries who were fighting in Italy, but didn't really care about who actually won or not. Um, Don Juan was unaffected by Elvira's tears. Uh, the massacres of Indians melt, meant nothing to Pizarro. And she says, indifferent to the ends they set up for themselves, 
They were more indifferent to the means of attaining them. They cared only for their pleasure or their glory. And so the adventurer actually shares the nihilist contempt for other human beings. It gets worse than that. She points out that in order to enjoy their freedom, in order to enjoy their capacity to do what it is that they want to do, they will collaborate. They will give in. They will submit themselves to those who can provide them the means that they need. She says um, he needs money, arms, soldiers, or the support of the police and the laws. It's not a matter of chance but a dialectical necessity which leads the adventurer to be complacent regarding all regimes which defend the privilege of a class or party, more particularly authoritarian regimes and fascism. He needs fortune, leisure, and enjoyment, and will take these goods as supreme ends in order to be prepared to remain free in regard to any end. So in order to hold on to their ability to be a player, to, to play the game, they will collaborate with those who are depriving other human beings of their freedom, who are crushing other human beings, who are abusing them, and thereby become complicit, even while denying their complicity in that. And so that's another problematic aspect of adventurers. Wait around long enough and you'll see an adventurer sooner or later fall into that. Even if they're on the side of the good guys at first, the side of human freedom, all it takes is them to you know, run into a difficult situation and they will go to the, the other side. And so she says that somebody who's a real lover of freedom won't trust an adventurer. There's also one other uh, important consideration here. She talks about the, essentially the legacy, what remains of the subjectivity of the adventurer. And she says that in their lifetime, they're trying to make everybody see things their way. They're aiming, they're, they're trying to go towards a future into recognition or ad, admiration. When he dies, the adventurer will be surrendering his whole life into the hands of, of men. The only meaning it will have will be the one they confer on it. He knows since he talks, he knows this since he talks about himself often in books. And isn't this interesting the way that she's doing it? They write memoirs about themselves. They try to spin their, their own legacy. It doesn't really work. And we might say that even more in our time than in their own time, you can't really control what other people are going to make of you. You could actually be a genuinely good person and be marked as a terrible person by lies being spread about you. But the adventurer doesn't have to do that. They're usually going to be kind of a selfish bastard anyway, and they're going to be, have lied to other people about you know, why they did the things that they did and put on a good face about it. And then sooner or later, somebody's going to cut through the lies and say, they were kind of a scumbag, weren't they? They might have had a, a nice face or a charming way of, of being or put on the best parties or did cool things. But sooner or later, it's up to other people to make the decision. History decides about them. And so they, they, in the end, they don't actually manage to remain within what she called this solipsism, this self-centered understanding of freedom. And this is another defective way of using one's freedom. Notice that there is an out that's possible here where you realize that you exist in a world that has other people that are others just as much as uh, you. They are just as human as you. They have freedom and there could be a different response to that, but the adventurer doesn't take that route and instead they go along with stressing their freedom over that of others.